from the recording found on the corpse of Trent Vickers, currently only accessible to members of Mandeville's police and other law enforcement agencies. Lies are locks, they keep us out. Lies are locks, they trap us in. Lies are locks, indeed. Truth, truth is the key, the key to open the door of truth. What will we find there? The dead beg for nothing. The living beg for relief. Relief from the hell that I have brought to Mandeville. No one is safe. Your lies protected you for so long. But now, now the truth shall shine bright. Liars fill their pockets with ill-gotten gold. Liars shall be held accountable. Liars shall be forced to stand before the door of truth and confess their sins. Only then shall peace return. Dalton Bradshaw and Simon Lyman, you are but bit players in the grand scheme before you. The true stars have yet to rise, though they shall soon enough. In the meantime, I promise that we will keep you both entertained. Be warned though, your lives are of no real importance and may be snuffed out at any time. Perhaps you should make haste and bring my stars to Mandeville. The victim and the liar must face vindiction. The longer you stall, the more death we shall bring to you. Remember, only the truth can open the door to peace. Lies will only bring you death. Bradshaw and Lyman listened to this recording for probably the hundredth time as they stood before the desk of the police chief Mitchell Hardy. The chief was pissed, had been pissed since the incidents began happening again. Now he was moving beyond pissed into a new zone of rage that made Bradshaw cringe a bit. To make matters worse, Lyman had now taken his seat and was apparently scrolling through something on his cell phone as the chief was just getting started. Bradshaw felt his stomach tighten in anticipation for the ass chewing to come. You two, how, how did this get so fucked up? The chief demanded. Sir, we did everything in our power to contain this. However, Dalton began, but was interrupted as the chief continued his rant. You had some pretty simple orders, Bradshaw. Keep this shit quiet. All you had to do was write up the incident at the Dermot house as a B&E that ended with the perp being killed in self-defense. Was that too fucking hard? And you, Lyman, I'm not sure if your superiors are in Banton Rogue told you or not, but your whole purpose as our expert here was to conclude 100% that this had nothing to do with the Jeff Woods incident from 2015. Jeff the killer is something that everyone just wants to fucking forget. The 2015 incident was a disaster for everyone involved here. So why in the hell is it that you managed to not only fail in your first goal, but then managed to somehow start a fucking sequel? No one wants a sequel to 2015. No one. Lyman looked up from his phone for just a moment to respond. I don't know about all of that, sir. Some people thought that the 2015 was handled well. I mean, sure, it wasn't perfection. But let's be honest. It didn't help that half the brass in this town went out of their way to cover the whole damn thing up. Maybe if you all just done your jobs in the first place, instead of worrying about protecting one rich old man, we wouldn't be sitting here right now. Hardy looked stunned. He was not a man he used to be spoken back to, especially in his own office where he made the policy and enforced the laws. It did the situation no favors that the man currently talking down to him was half his age, wearing a t-shirt with something called a home star runner printed on the front. Just who the hell do you think you are? Hardy asked, his voice stunned, now then angry. I don't think I'm anything. However, I know that I'm a state agent. I know that my boss has the governor on speed dial. Can you say the same thing? I know my boss told me to disregard your request that I came down here just to whitewash the incident. I also know that you, as chief of police, must be aware that instructing a government agent to falsify a report is a pretty hefty charge. Maybe that's the way you're used to doing things here? But it's not the way I do business, chief. I was told to come down here and conduct their real investigation. You have a serious problem on your hands here, chief. The fact that you haven't even held press conference yet is making you look like shit as well. So, maybe I'll just call one today. 
I have every legal right to seize the recording found on the crime scene, and if you keep acting like a fucking asshole, I might just do that. Maybe I'll go ahead and deputize Detective Bradshaw here, as an official attachment to the state for the duration of this case. That way, we don't need to deal with you at all anymore. Do you think perhaps that would be a good idea? Or maybe, who knows? Maybe I'll call the governor myself today. Let him know that your suburban snobs are obstructing justice down here. Again. Yeah, how do you like that? Chief Hardy was speechless. He wasn't sure if Lyman could do half of the things that he just threatened to do. But the idea of this young punk calling a press conference was enough to scare him into compliance. At least for the time being. He took a deep breath and plastered on a fake smile. Gentlemen, perhaps I was a bit too rash just now. This has been stressful for us all. I've had the mayor barking at me since this began, demanded that we close this case quickly. I shouldn't have taken this out on you, Agent Lyman. I apologize. No worries, Chief. Now, me and Dalton have some police work to do. I think I may have just found our next big break. Dalton, who've been shocked into silence by his young partner's sudden outburst, found his voice again. What? Did the CSI find something from the house? Better. I found something on YouTube. Check it out, Dalton. This is the clue. You're not gonna believe who uploaded a video response to this. From YouTube channel Jane of Arc, uploaded by Jane Arkansas. Jane, speaking directly into the camera. So you think this is funny? You think this is a joke now? People are dying. Something much larger is behind us. If you're crazy enough to think that some disfigured kid is running around in the shadows creating all of this, then you deserve it. I know things. My father received threats from lots of sources before his death. He was too close to all of it. He tried to erase Mandeville's past with his money. But what lies beneath the surface is something so broken and rotten on the inside that money cannot clean. There are people out there with very close connections to the situation from 2015 that still have agendas and goals. None of those goals are good. I spent a lot of time looking into this. Trust me, this didn't just start with the attack of the Dermots. This has been going for four years. Expelling Madsville Hayden and replacing him with my father did not fit anything. Removing corrupt officials from office and allowing them to run and hide in the shadows did not fit anything. Lives were ruined. Lives were lost. And I'm pretty sure minds were lost as well. My father was onto something before he was murdered. He figured something out. Something that runs much deeper than Jeffrey Woods, Matsuo Hayden, or any one person. If you want the truth, go back to the beginning. I will continue to release information as I put it together. To the law enforcement officials that are investigating this matter, know one thing right now. There's a massive smoke screen being put in front of you. That smoke screen is Jeff the Killer. Don't let the sensationalism around this case distract you. Look deeper. Well, I'll be. The prodigal daughter returns, Simon mumbled. How did she know about the incident with the Dermot family? I would venture to guess that by now Lane Dermot has spilled the beans to at least a couple of people. That kid didn't strike me as the type that would keep a secret for too long. Okay, we're going to go and talk to Jane Arkansas and find out what she knows. If her father really was receiving threats, I want to know what those threats were and who they came from, Dalton stated. It would make sense that he might be a target. He did step in for Maxwell Hayden, and he didn't exactly have a low profile while doing so. Between pissing off the crazies that hung out on Shercott Road, to probably pissing off a ton of Mandeville's older and wealthier elites, his list of enemies could be a mile long. Simon's cell phone chimes, indicating a test message. Oh hey, more good news I guess. It looks like the tech guys finally cracked the CD we found. Today is turning out to be interesting. So, where to first? Jane Arkansas or the CD? Simon considered for a moment and then answered. The CD for sure. We'll have plenty of time to talk with Jane. Whatever is on that CD though is directly from these assholes. And I just gotta know what's going to shard out there. Okay, 
I was sort of hoping that the chief would be gone by the time we head back to the station. But whatever. Fuck that guy. Let's get this done. Simon and Dalton returned to the Mandeville police station and prepared to view the contents of the DVD left for them the night they were almost run off the road. Hurry the fuck up, Dalt. A uniform officer called as the two investigators walked into the control booth of the Mandeville police station. Biteki looked as though he just discovered the Holy Grail, or the foundation of youth, without being asked. The tech immediately went into the explanation that neither Dalton nor Simon really understood. It took several days, but I finally cracked the encryptions on the DVD. Seems that whoever burned the information onto the disc used several variations of encryption software. Most likely the guy got a hold of encrypt disc and just tampered with the codes a bit. He knew that we'd be throwing government grade decryption at it, so I guess he wanted to make sure we got the point. Exactly what point would that be? Dalton asked sharply. My guess, he wanted us to know that he knew what he was doing. He clearly wanted us to crack the code. I mean, why else leave us the disk? No, I think this was more or less a bit of a computer saber rattling. Just a way of making sure we know he isn't an amateur. What then? How about we stop torturing ourselves with delayed gratification and get down to business? Simon stated jovially. Isn't the chief going to come out and watch? Dalman asked. He said he'll watch it later. I think he's preparing that press conference that everyone wants. I saw him going over paperwork. Another uniform cop replied. The techie pushed by and the video began. From DVD left behind by Jimmy 4x4 during the investigation into the attack on Dermot, property of Mandeville Police. Evidence number... 2461022 Gravely male boys, possibly. Electronically enhanced, menacing tone. Why does one choose to lie? If you're hearing this and believe somewhere that this is meant to be a profound question, you can stop. People choose to lie because they are human, they are weak and pathetic. They hide, they cheat, they destroy. All of this is done so they can reside in the shadows for a short while longer before eventually being forced to face the truth. One of my most central players has recently come forward, cast into the light, yet still hiding behind a mask of lies. Did he do it for money? Did he do it for forgiveness? That is one mystery that I intend to solve. DVD begins to display video footage Voice continues to speak as footage plays. What appears to be a video shot on a camcorder or a low-quality video recording device appears. Footage shows two police cars working outside of the former home of Jeffrey Woods. Two youths, clearly Jeff and Leah Woods from 2015, are then seen walking up to the front door of their home. The timestamp on the video confirms that this was filmed on the day that Jeff and Leo fought Randy and his friends at the video store. To the police officers who are attempting to make sense of this, know that the events of today were set in motion many years ago. Nothing here is random. Nothing here is chaotic. Everything, from the profound to the mundane, has been analyzed and predicted. Video of Shelia and Jeffrey Woods arriving at the home of Brigitte Hayden appears. Truth is actually far more delicate than lies. Lies are man-made, after all. Products of intelligent craft. A lie can be built upon, improved upon, and strengthened. Much like a simple fort that eventually grows into a castle, which eventually becomes a village, and finally, a city. The truth, however, is fragile, as it can only exist as it is. It cannot be improved or fortified. It cannot be developed into a superior product by group collaboration. The truth is only the truth. Nothing can be added or taken away. Video of the ambulance parked outside of the Hayden's home appears on the screen. A stretcher is shown taking Jeffrey Woods from the garage to the ambulance. The truth exits that day for only a brief period. Randy, Keith and Troy and Jeff all knew the truth. That delicate fact existed only the moment Officer Wilson arrived 
At that point, it was polluted into a lie. Video appears of Randy Hayden in court at his inquest hearing. The judge is smiling contently as he writes notes. Randy steps down from the stand and joins his father. Who can be trusted now? Now that the blood has spilled upon the floor, who can we turn to? A still image of Leo Wood signing copies of his book at a New York City bookstore is shown. And even when the truth is told, some move quickly to pollute that truth. Video shows the outside of the fireworks booth where the interview between Benny Rosenberg and Jeffrey Woods took place. The footage, shot at night, shows Jeff Woods exit the fireworks stand and quickly look around before walking briskly into the dark woods behind the booth. There is much more truth to be found. If you made it this far, let us continue our journey. Observe. The video continues to show the fireworks booth. And from the corner of the screen, a figure can be seen approaching the entrance to the tiny building. The truth has become so twisted that by now, I can safely assure to you that you know nothing. You may learn more as you go, should you survive. Be warned though, I am not a friend. I'm not some wise mentor here to lead you to enlightenment. I am a bearer of truth. But never forget that honesty and peace do not always travel together. I shall guide you, but not with the gentle hand of a shepherd, but rather the firm hand of a taskmaker. This would not be a pleasant journey. You cannot escape this now. You cannot opt out. Should you still question the severity of the infection caused by the lies and corruption within Mandeville, allow me to demonstrate just how critical this situation has become. The screen flashes to solid red. Kill one now. Dalton Bradshaw raised an eyebrow, his mind swirling with questions. He glanced toward Simon to voice his quandarings and suddenly felt that all color drained from his face. He drew in a breath to call out a warning. He felt his muscles tense as he prepared to launch forward. However, Everything happened far too quickly for any reaction to lend aid. One of the uniform officers, a guy whose name Dalton wasn't even sure he knew, drew his pistol from its holster. The officer aimed the gun directly behind Simon's head. Simon, whose attention had been locked completely on the video playing on the screen before them, never even realized what was happening directly behind him. In the next second, the officer fired his pistol at point-blank range into the back of Simon's head. The report was deafening in the small room. Every cop was momentarily stunned. Dalton, who watched the event unfold, reached for his pistol. His first instinct was to shoot this apparent rogue cop. Then he realized that if the rogue cop died, so too did the truth of what the hell just happened here. As Simon's corpse fell to the floor in a graphic display of spraying blood and fallen brain matter, the rogue cop placed his pistol to his own head. What the fuck are you doing? Dalton screamed. Smiling, the officer replied in a manic, rising voice. Serving my purpose. The truth opens the door, Detective Broadshaw. In the next moment, the officer fired his gun into his own head joining Simon on the floor, brothers in death. From the press conference held by Mandeville's police chief, Mitchell Hardy. Today is a horrific day that would go down in infamy within our beloved city of Mandeville. Today we mourn the loss of Louisiana State Police Investigator Lyman. Agent Lyman was tasked to assist us in the investigation of the recent attack on a local family by an assailant who wore a disguise that we believe was intended to mimic Jeffrey Woods. Over the course of the investigation, evidence was discovered that led investigators to believe that at least one other individual was involved. Police were led to an abandoned home on Shercott Road, an unincorporated St. Tammy Parish, technically located outside of Mandeville city limits, where the body of a young man who has long history of mental illness was found. The victim is believed to have committed suicide and left a recording, 
mostly contained encrypted messages that we now believe were nothing more than byproducts of his mental health issues. We are saddened that he was not able to get the help that he needed. Then today, while reviewing further evidence, Agent Lyman was murdered by a rogue police officer who was believed to be suffering from work-related stress. The officer, Brandon Crane, would then turn his service pistol on himself and in his own life as well. At this time, we are confident that the threat is contained. The current evidence that we have available suggests that the initial attack was carried out by yet another individual with a history of a mental illness. It is unfortunate that neither Brian Antoinus, the young man who don't face pain to try and mimic the appearance of Jeffrey Woods, and Trent Vickers, a youth who had a long documented fascination with morbid topics were unable to receive the proper medical assistance they clearly needed. And now we must face the most painful of truths, that Officer Brandon Crane, a young man who served our community for almost two years, was apparently also involved in this tragic set of circumstances. There will be a memorial service for Agent Lyman in Botson Rogue, LA. The time, date, and location will be announced once preparations are completed. We, as brothers and sisters of Batch, are all deeply hurt at the loss of this great man of justice. At this time, I'm not taking questions. If anyone wants further information, I encourage you to reach out to our public relations office. Thank you, and God bless. Lord of shit right there. A slight drunk man grunted at the television mountain in the Abbey, a dive bar in downtown New Orleans, as the press conference faded out, replaced by sports and the weather. What do you say there, detective? The young bartender asked. She had a sleeve of tattoos on her arms featuring various sea life. On this night, Dalton Bradshaw would have happily drowned among them. It's not detective shit anymore. I'm off the forest, Jerry. I guess it's just Mr. Bradshaw from here on out. Sherry Willis, who'd serve Bradshaw cheap drinks most weekends since she started working at the Abbey, showed genuine concern. She liked the man, although he was likely twice her age. Perhaps she just admired his pragmatic nature, or maybe she had some father issues. But either way, she always liked it when he came in. What happened? I thought you were one of those cop for a life type guys. Sherry, that's a story I gladly tell you over breakfast, which likely means you'll never hear it. He tried to laugh at his own situation, but in reality, Dalton was miserable and very concerned for the future of the people he was once charged with protecting. Sherry looked over the man before her. Sure, he was old and his teeth were stained and a bit crooked. He smoked like a chimney and would probably run out of steam before her. Still though, she fancied him for some strange reason that only a psychiatrist would understand. After all, she was 26, had a full body of tattoos and piercings, and would likely be kicked out of her circle of punk goth friends for sleeping with a middle-aged cop. She could tell, though, that he was hurting badly and likely wasn't even serious about his offer for breakfast storytelling. But she decided to throw him a bone just the same, or perhaps allow him to throw her one. I close up this dump in about an hour. Stay around. You can be my security guard. Walk me home. I think I need someone to check my bedroom anyways. Make sure there aren't any scary monsters under the bed. You sure? Yeah. Anything that could get one of my regular drunks as down and out as this is something that I like to hear. Dalton managed to smile after all. In all honesty, he still wasn't happy. He and Simon hadn't exactly become friends, but they worked well together, and a friendship would have formed eventually. He respected the kid's gumption. What was worse was how he was let go today. Just another fucking cover up in Mandeville. His story repeating itself once more, just because lying and hiding seemed to be the nature of that particular beast. Hardy wanted Dalton out of the way. That much was clear. He wanted to steer this investigation back on its own tracks. The press conference alone proved that much. 
Hardy was clearly trying to tell the people of Mandeville that the case was all wrapped up. But Dalton knew much better. He and Simon had done a bit more investigating during the four days following the discovery of Ricker's body. They learned much more. They've both decided to keep that additional information to themselves until the case could be wrapped up without fear of yet another snow job. However, it would appear that for the time being at least, the forecast was quite snowy for Mandeville. Dalton threw back another shot of whiskey and waited patiently for Sherry Willis to take him far away from his problems for at least a little while. Meanwhile, in Mandeville, a young woman sat alone in a large home surrounded by a massive gate. Jane Arkansas examined the names and faces before her. Photographs all tacked up to her wall. Jeffrey Woods, Leah Woods, Randy Hayden, Matswell Hayden, Powell Dermott, and many more stared back at her. She knew there was much more to this story. She knew that the chief's press conference was a lie to hide a lie. She knew that she had work to do. It's starting again, she whispered, as she tagged photos of Simon Lyman and Dalton Brunshaw to her wall. She inherited much of her father's fortune when she turned 18. Now she was just entering her 20s, saddled with a fortune that she cared little about. She was aware that most women her age, with her current level of wealth, would be jet-setting off to Europe, taking inane selfies and consuming cheap liquor in expensive bottles. However, Jane K. Arkansas cared for none of those things. Her father had been murdered. Her home had set ablaze. She escaped with her life, but in the process, she inherited a dire mission one which she would happily spend all of her newly acquired money to get rid of. But she knew better. She knew that this was not something she would allow herself to abandon. It compelled her forward, even though she was fully capable of hopping into the nearest jet and never looking back. Jane reached up and touched the photos of Leah Woods and Randy Hayden. As she did, she whispered to herself, There is a lot to do now much to get in order. You boys are coming home very soon after all. 